And onto the subject of reentrancy. Um, we have perhaps previously discussed earlier the idea of side effects from a function call, that is to say a change of something you know, inside this function that is visible outside of that function. Um, and uh, reentrancy is the idea about, you know, can you go out and in again? Uh, that is, can there be concurrent calls to the same function without any issue? Uh, the trivial example of a non reentrant C function for swapping two variables is we have variables x and y, and there's a global variable temp, uh, and we swap by writing things into temp, uh, and then y is assigned x, and then uh, x is assigned temp, uh, and that works. Um, it's not reentrant though, because there is a global variable and it is changed on every invocation of the function. We can make it reentrant by moving the declaration of temp inside the function, which would actually mean that every invocation is independent of every other, and that would actually make it uh, thread safe as well. Doing it wrong is highly discouraged by Rust as a language uh, because it doesn't want you to use global state if it can help it, and it makes potential side effects clear by requiring references be annotated as mutable. Um, but a reentrant function looks something like this. Um, and it is a function that can be suspended uh, in the middle uh, and be re-entered, that is called again, before the previous execution returns. That does not mean it is necessarily always thread safe, although usually that is the case, but they are two separate things. And you can have a re-entrant function that is not thread safe, and you can have a thread safe function that is not re-entrant. Um, but thread safe is essentially no data races. Um, and that's obviously kind of uh, no big deal if uh, you only modify uh, local data. Uh, and so a uh, reentrancy example, courtesy of Wikipedia, again, just in C for, uh, for the sake of it, uh, is that if you're swapping something and there's a possibility of a, uh, an interrupt, say a hardware interrupt, or catching a, a control C handler or something like that, um, there is a distinct possibility that something could go wrong. Um, and uh, for this reason, when we talked about signal handling, uh, there were, and this is effectively an interrupt subroutine, uh, you want your interrupt subroutine to be reentrant uh, because interrupts can get interrupted by higher priority things, and you could just restart the one you were previously doing, or uh, you could resume where you were before. Um, either way, if the code is not reentrant, we could have problems. Rust's ownership concept make it difficult for you to change something you shouldn't with a signal handler, calling some non-reentrant function, um, but it is still something to be a little bit careful about. Um, and if you wanted a reentrancy example uh, uh, where you can see what went wrong, uh, if we are swapping A and B and uh, we have uh, initial values of 3 and 4 and there's an interrupt subroutine which changes some values, uh, so X is assigned 1 and Y is assigned 2 and swap things, then we can end up with final values that are not the same as their expected values. Okay, how do we fix it? Well, I mean, you could um, save the global variable uh, and restore it later. Uh, in your interrupt handler, which is something akin to what hardware does when we see an interrupt, uh, we can store the state of our program stack uh, and restore it later. Um, but of course, the ideal would be not calling non reentrant functions uh, in the middle uh, of uh, a signal handler. That would be good. Uh, and there's also further uh, a little trace here uh, that shows you exactly what, uh, what goes wrong and uh, when it's fixed and how we make sure that everything is uh, back to the way it should be by storing and restoring the global state. Now, uh, if your code is not reentrant, as we can see in you know, the C-type example, we could easily run into problems. Um, but that might make you think that um, something that is going to have a side effect is bad. Uh, and functional programming languages, Scala, Haskell, that kind of thing, lend themselves nicely to be parallelized because a purely functional program has no side effects, uh, and it does make it a lot easier to parallelize such a program, uh, which could potentially give you a good speed up. Uh, if a function is for some reason impure, that is to say it does have side effects, it has to indicate in some languages in its function signature. 
and that makes it easy to identify what things uh, are, well, hard to parallelize or can't be parallelized. Uh, I mean, the, the notion of purity in this sense is not implying any sort of moral judgment on your code. Uh, I, I would like to point that out. Uh, however, uh, it's just the terminology that's used. Uh, and um, basically, if we have purely functional code, then it resembles the thing on the left where it is, there's input and there's output, and whatever happens in the middle remains in there. Uh, if we have procedural programs, C is a procedural programming language, there are potentially arbitrary side effects, uh, and Rust is really no different uh, in, in this regard. Uh, and uh, if, if you listen to Joel about this, uh, he would say, well, without understanding functional programming, you can't invent MapReduce, the algorithm that makes Google so massively scalable. The terms Map and Reduce come from Lisp and functional programming, and MapReduce is, in retrospect, obvious to anyone who remembers from their 6.001 equivalent programming class that purely functional programs have no side effects and are thus trivially parallelizable. Uh, you know, the map and reduce steps could easily be uh, farmed out to different machines, uh, and we could do a lot with that. Uh, and uh, for object-oriented programming, I, I like to uh, say get brain dot damage, uh, which is a, a very Javaism, if you ask me. Um, but object-oriented programming gives us bad habits in terms of thinking in a functional style. Um, if in a functional style you need a computation result, you have to wait, but you are trying to write your code like a mathematical function. So like f of x, y, and z pr produces a result a, b, and c. Uh, but we don't do that in a lot of our object-oriented programming. We make a lot of void methods, and in functional programming it doesn't work because, well, there's inputs and there's outputs, and if a function returns nothing, what does it do? Um, so, you know, that doesn't... That kind of thinking doesn't make sense, uh, and part of the problem with object-oriented programming is we have a lot of state uh, of various objects spread out over many different places. If you have lots of different objects, you have a shipment, and a shipment has containers, uh, and containers have packages, and packages have goods. All of those things have their own individual state, and if it's all mutable, there is not very much you could do to parallelize some of these things. However, um, you know, there can be side effects, um, and uh, we usually want to avoid them, but they're not necessarily bad. Um, one potential side effect is printing to console. It's something that you want. You can't really do that reentrantly, and it does have some observable state outside the call to that function, because anybody who's looking at the console can see what was printed there. Uh, but you obviously wouldn't write a programming language in which you couldn't write anything to the console, nor would you want to use one if such a thing existed, because, well, you know, sending data to the console is important as a debugging thing, uh, and is also also just an important part of you know, how your program runs. So side effects will exist even in functional programming. The goal is just to minimize them. Uh, and there exist these kinds of things in C++ uh, and other uh, similar languages as well. Uh, it's, it was added in C++11 uh, in C++17, which admittedly does not have a lot of support. Uh, out there in the world, there are parallel and vectorized algorithms, uh, and you can specify some execution policy, and the compiler will do it, which takes some of the uh, headache out of your hands. Uh, and you can get it to uh, undertake some things like sort, reverse, is he? Um, for each n, reduce, those kinds of things uh, are given to you intrinsically in the language. So, yeah, uh, as I mentioned, um, certain things are inevitably uh, going to have side effects, and, you know, printing is one of them. Um, restarting a print routine would result in doubled characters on the screen. You know, it's not the end of the world. Nothing terrible happens, but uh, it's not what you want. Um, and so, yeah, we've used purity without giving really a good definition, uh, but the notion of purity is based on whether or not it has side effects, uh, and also whether if its output depends solely on its inputs. Uh, and pure functions should be implemented as thread safe and reentrant, uh, so that you can call them you know, as many times as you want from wherever you want, interrupt them, restart them uh, without any sort of issue, and uh, still always get the same result. Um, so, uh, you know, is the previous re-entrant code also thread safe? 
you know, if if this is what we have here, where uh, um, we're going to save the global variable and and restore it, does it work? Uh, um, well, no. Uh, if we look at the final values uh, as compared to the expected values, we can see they're not the same. B is 3 in the final values when it should be 1. Uh, and although T is 1 and it should be undefined, you know, uh, is less important because T is just sort of your global temporary state. Um, but we would still consider this to be kind of wrong. Uh, and if you wanted another definition of a thread safe function, it is a function whose effect, when called by two or more threads, is guaranteed to be as if the threads each executed the function one after another in an undefined order, even if the actual execution is interleaved. Uh, again, if you've taken a databases course, you might picture something similar to this uh, when we talk about transactions uh, that if transactions have to be serializable uh, it, then it means the outcome is as if the transactions happened in a specific order sequentially so first transaction A and then transaction B or first transaction B and then transaction A even if they both ran concurrently if their operation was interleaved uh, and if you have thread safe functions it doesn't matter if they run in an interleaved fashion there is an order in which you can say it's as if it happened in that order uh, and that gives you some reassurance that it is in fact correct. Um, Rust does not in, uh, enforce in any way a functional style. Uh, you don't have to use it if you don't want, um, but it does give you some hints in that direction. For one thing, it discourages mutability of data, which is sort of functional. Uh, mutability is uh, you know, a big in inhibition to parallelization and functional programming languages discourage mutability and so does Rust. Uh, and so there is a little bit of overlap in that regard. Um, there is internal mutability where you have you know, a structure and you can change things in you know, the vector that is pointed to by that structure, but it is somewhat discouraged, uh, which also is sort of functional-ish. Uh, and it points you uh, towards uh, making arguments to functions be either immutable references or an ownership transfer, which prevents concurrency uh, and otherwise uh, points you down this road that you don't have to take. I mean, you can make everything mutable if you want it and Rust wouldn't stop you. Although the compiler will tell you sometimes this is mutable and it doesn't have to be. Um, but in uh, good Rust programming style, you would avoid things being mutable when they don't have to be. And because things are immutable by default, if you change your mind about something, the compiler will say, no, wait a minute, you said this wasn't mutable. Uh, and you might then rethink what you're doing accordingly.